Hi, I'm Mohammed Anwar. And I'm Chris Petrie. And, and we're, we're about, about to have, have a productive conversation, conversation with Mike Vardy. You've probably worked through countless strategies when it comes to business, but you probably haven't thought of using love as a business strategy. Well, today, I'm happy to announce that you can figure out how to do that. Thanks to the conversation I'm having with Mohammed Anwar and Christopher Peter. Chris is a student of the world. He enjoys anthropology, history, travel, and culinary experiences. Whereas Mohammed is the youngest of five children, was born and raised in Saudi Arabia to Indian parents from Megalaroo. This this group of fellows, along with Jeffrey Ma and uh, Frank Dana, put together this book. And they all are part of Softway, so we want to we want to get into that uh, with with them. You know, I mean, with especially with Chris and Muhammad because they're the ones I talk to. But they're all part of this this company, and they decided to put together and and, and build this book. And this book is it's dense, it's it's a solid read, and it just goes to show you that love can be a sound business strategy. So we're going to get to that conversation now. We're going to figure out how to make that happen. And that's why I'm glad that I'm going to be speaking with Muhammad and Chris here on A Productive Conversation. Let's get started. A lot of, lot of, lot of synchronicity going on uh, during this conversation <laughs> as we get things kicked yeah. off. I've never, uh, in the history of the this iteration of the podcast, because the podcast used to be called The Productivity is Podcast. Now it's called A Productive Conversation. So I've never had to do that intro with two people before, but I'm glad mm-hmm. it, because you know it was about time we did it. And the fact, the fact of the matter is it was going to happen sooner or later. So why not do it? And you guys did a great job. In fact, I loved it. And, and we're going to talk about love in this book, Love as a Business Strategy, Resilience, Belonging, and Success. So first off, before we get into the this conversation, um, I want to know how you two kind of, and I know you kind of get into this a little bit in the book, but how did you guys come across each other? What, what drew you to each other um, when it comes to the kind of the work that you do? Awesome. So, um, I can get started. So, you know, obviously I was running my software business, a technology firm. And at the time we were actively looking out for talented people to come join our team. And I was introduced to Chris Petrie by another acquaintance of ours. And when we met and we talked and spoke, uh, you know, we found this, uh, Opportunity, I suppose. I like Chris speak to his side, but I felt very comfortable with Chris coming on board and helping Softway with whatever he could bring his talents to the organization. Um, and I, I, to be honest, we hadn't even really defined his role as to what he was coming on board for. It was just I just knew at the moment in time that Chris would be a great addition to the organization, and he could bring a lot of his talents. His his uh, wisdom and his learnings to our organization to only better uh, help our organization. So that's kind of how we met. And it was also Beyonce's birthday, I believe. So Chris, I'll let you take that story. <laughs> yeah. So my interview was on September the 4th, which is Beyonce's birthday. If you're a fan, some people are fans, some people are not, it's okay. Um, and um, I made that comment and Muhammad was so confused. Like, why would somebody be talking about Beyonce, you know, um, and an interview, no less. But I did, it happened, real story. Um, and as Muhammad mentioned, we were introduced, um, you know, came into Softway at that time um, and was learning more about the organization um, and was really sort of fascinated with everything that was happening. Um, the good, the bad, and the ugly. I don't believe in a perfect workplace, so that's not what I was looking for. Mm-hmm. Um, but that being said, all of the things that were going on in Softway were not <laughs> sort of um, presented, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, up front. Uh, but again, it was a challenge that I was eager to get into. Um, but also, I, I believe firmly that, you know, once you have had a successful career going in to help um, and bring your expertise to new organizations that are in need of it, um, that are not riding high and sort of already successful. Because, you know, for me, I like to to actually see things change and and sort of, you know, you know, become something totally different than what what it was. Um, and that's what I saw at Softway. It was a, a really cool organization, great people, um, and there was a lot of opportunity to try some new stuff and apply what I had learned. So, 
Chris, you brought up Beyonce, which I think is is interesting because I mean she's a singer, she's she's a performer, she's so much more than that too. She's an actress, and she she she's obviously connected. Uh, she, they're part of the like one half of one of the biggest power couples in in entertainment too, right? So there yes. there is that, mm -hmm. but um, yeah. the idea of love is exuded from not just her music, but what she does and how she presents herself. And so as I'm going through the book, Love is a Business Strategy, we're going to talk about the culture of love. We're going to get to that point. But what? why do you think, and we're just going to cut right to the chase, why do you think love is a solid business strategy going on the heels of what we of, of that Beyonce idea? Because, I mean, clearly, <laughs> I mean, she loves what she does. She gets, I mean, and, and there is this, there's almost like this this um, passion, like, and, and I think that that's it too, right? There's a passion element, but love, like, yeah. where does that come into play for you, especially now w with the role that you have and your role in, in putting together this book? Yeah, no, and I think uh, that's a great way to segue because I think that she has really, in all of her music, all of her artistry, um, she's really shown the different sides of love because most people just see her romantic ballads as like the box. Mm -hmm. um, but the way that she talks about her mom, the way that she talks about her daughter and her, her son, the way that she talks about um, her sister, the way that she talks about the community that she supports, the, the mark she wants to leave, you know, all of that is in, in, sort of encompassing her artistry. And when we look at love, we see it as sort of that all-encompassing, it's a behavior, it's a set of behaviors, it's obligations, it's commitments, um, it's tough, it's soft, it's all of those things, right? But it's ultimately um, sort of a series of um, bi-directional communication and behaviors that cement a team or a couple or, you know, a group um, around a common vision, outcome, but also a standard of way of operating inside of that relationship. Um, and so, you know, for us, we see love as a business strategy as just that, right? A set of operating standards that and behaviors that we all are committed to as a team, as a company. Um, and when we are operating out, out of bounds, we have the right to talk about it. We have the right to call it out. We have the right to ask someone to go somewhere else, right? We have those things because, you know, what we've learned is that those behaviors um, and those things that we hold true in terms of how we treat each other, um, when those are breached, it's not successful business anymore. Mm -hmm. Even if we might get short-term wins, it's not successful. It's not sustainable. It's not attracting anybody else to the company. It's actually, you know, hurting us, right? Um, and while I know that there are businesses out there that don't, you know, subscribe to this or don't feel like it's necessary, what we've seen in our relationships with customers and our relationships with employees and in our relationship with the partners and, and others who are sort of aligned to the cause, um, those behaviors make the world a difference because because they're often absent. Like when you've never had it before, you start coming into a place of work or, you know, customer conversations where it's just an ease in the room, right? Um, and you can be direct. You can be yourself. You can show up. And if you're having a bad day, you can say so, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Um, and, and not be held against you. And you have an ability to work on a better solution or a better outcome or resolve things in ways that allow everyone to win. Um, it's, it's just a breath, a breath of fresh air. So for us, love is a business strategy because it opens the door to so many much more outcomes and, and diverse opinions. Mohammed, as, as you're putting the book together, I mean, it, it's divided up into three distinct parts, right? You know, why love is good for business, understanding the culture of love, which I, again, I'm going to dive into and then putting love yeah. to work. So what was what was the reasoning behind, you know, the structure that you put together? And, and, and further to that, to, to kind of tack onto that, there are four credited authors to this book, two of whom yes. I'm speaking with right now. So the parts are fascinating to me, but how did you get, like, it's interesting that there would be consensus going through this too, you know what I mean? Because I've, again, I've interviewed people that have had, you know, co-authors. I just did one the other day with uh, Dr. Michael Bruce, who's going to be on an upcoming episode. But uh, the, the fact that there's four authors, I mean, that has to go along the line with with love being the business strategy. You've got to be on, on, on the same point for that, right? Uh, absolutely. I think uh, the experience of writing a book with four authors 
when we were first uh, starting off to go down this journey, a lot of people warned us, like, you know, we were talking to some editors and publishers and they were all like, four authors, let me give you some warning uh, and advice <laughs> that we've never, we've bar barely seen two authors try to get on the same page of a book, uh, literally. Like, how did you, how do you anticipate having four authors working on this? But from day one, we were very aligned and committed, not only because... Uh, we believe in love as a business strategy, but we've been through together, through this whole journey of transformation that our organization went through, instituting the culture of love. So every one of us are firm believers, but also we respect each other's opinions, perspectives, because that's what really defines, you know, high performing teams and organizations is when we are able to accept and adapt to each other's difference of opinions and differences. We wanted to bring that to life in the book. We didn't want to come with one perspective. We didn't want to write a book that just appeals to one type of a persona, but write a book from all the different lens and perspectives to make it more meaningful, flavorful, bring different personalities to the book and make it more enjoyable and relatable. So we went on this journey and, you know, in fact, I think it got us closer to each other. We ended up uh, really bonding over the book writing experience even more than we already had mm. prior to the book writing experience. Um, and as far as writing the chapters, like, you know, the whole exercise of trying to figure out how to break it down in sections, we obviously try to take an approach of, you know, someone wanting to read this book are probably going to be intrigued by what is love mm -hmm. mean in the workplace? So why not start off with that to answer that question? And once we have them convinced, let's give them the why behind uh, all of the elements of culture of love. And then the last part was, how do you now implement this in your business to get your business outcome? So the driving thing was the what, why, and how, and th that's how the three parts came into existence. And, um, you know, all of our perspectives are, uh, you know, embedded in each of the chapters, each of the sections. And uh, um, I, I, I felt like uh, it was a really good cohesive message, uh, yet bringing that element of personalities in there. What businesses, uh, Chris, do you think need to read this book? Like what, when it comes to this, because I mean, it's, 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 yeah. there is a nobility and an aspirational element to this idea, but Love is qualitative, not quantitative. And most businesses are like, well, hold on. And I, and I can speak from the productivity perspective. Is like, how much time is this going to take? Well, you know, sometimes things take the time they take. Yeah, that's not good enough. I need to know time. I need numbers because numbers <laughs> are objective, right? Whereas love, you know, and quality can be very subjective. So if there's some hesitance for a business to go, wait a minute, like I can't, qual I can't quantify that. Like, what do you say to those people? One, I used to be one of you. <laughs> um, so like, I'm not like, this is not a preachy moment, nor is this a judgy moment because I came from the same place. Like numbers are drive business. It's the, it's the language of business, so to speak. Um, but it hit me. I used to have a mentor. She um, was a CEO at the time. And, you know, she would often show and talk about numbers all the time. And one-on-one, -on -one, like, I looked to her as a mentor, right? And she said, you know, Chris, when you look at every line item here on this financial statement, everything is driven by a behavior. And behaviors come from humans. So I can look at this all day long. We can all look at this all day long. But if we are not changing our behavior, these numbers won't change. These numbers won't shift. And so for those folks who are number-driven and data-driven and oriented around outcomes and meeting certain you know, uh, quotas, whatever the case may be, um, you have to be able to attach those numbers to your everyday behaviors. Um, and so that's what we've done. Um, and we do that hard work with our clients. So no matter what your goals are, we support numbers, we support data, we, we believe in it too. Mm -hmm. um, but if we can't assign and figure out what behaviors are driving that performance number that you're so quickly trying to change or move, um, then we can't you know, expect anything different. Um, and so that would be my, my plea to those who are, to those businesses and those business leaders who are rightly oriented around the numbers, but you know, it's our job and our role and what we do every single day is to help clients figure out what behavior 
what mindsets, what attitudes, and what communication styles are influencing these numbers, and how do we trigger those changes where they need to be changed? Yeah. yeah. I think in, uh, down in Texas, there's a saying, you can't fatten the cow by measuring it every day. Mm. You got to you gotta take action, right? So every line item that Chris is referring to, there is a behavior attributed to it. If you're having poor sales, poor revenue, poor profitability, if you really dig down and look at it, behaviors are what is driving those numbers from going up and down inside of your organization. And so when you put it all together, behaviors and culture attribute or ladder up to business outcomes. And when you're able to see the attribution, which we have a framework for, then it becomes very easy to even appease uh, the audiences that are very data-driven. So as someone who studies time, I think someone's going to say, and, and I know this because yeah. we all come across this, is how do I make time for this? Like how do, yeah. again, Chris is pointing, you can't see this, right, <laughs> but Chris is totally pointing at himself right now. And, and it, it's, I definitely, you know, it, it's fascinating because as I was going through the book, and especially when you go through some of the, the culture, I've been listening to a lot of Brene Brown fellow Texan lately. Yes. Um, yes. And, and there's definitely some elements that I can see. I mean, two of the elements that the cultures you talk about are empathy and vulnerability. Brene Brown is like, she, she might as well have invented those to a degree. Do you know what I mean? Like, but, yeah. but, yes. but there's people that go, yeah, there, there's these biases. There's these friction points that keep us from exploring that. And often it's the, I don't have time or how can I leverage the time to make that work? So you've talked about a framework here, Muhammad, but like, mm -hmm. Beyond that, and I and I know you go over it in the book, and I don't want to. We don't want to go like yeah. spoiler alert. Like, go, I mean, yeah. you want to pick up the book, but for someone who's like, this all sounds great. Okay, you've got me in on the love thing, but how do I make time to set this stuff up? Uh, how much time is this going to take? I'd love to get your thoughts on that because there's definitely um, there's that that would be another I think friction point for some people. Yeah, uh, there's a whole chapter, the last chapter of the book. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't wait for the world to change. Basically, it's our no excuses chapter. We take every excuse down from I don't have time, I don't have budget, I don't, you know, I'm not in charge, I'm not responsible. Like we address all of those, uh, but ultimately, it comes down to like if you are going to want to desire outcomes, business outcomes, and change. Uh, and time is an expensive resource, you're not going to get results if you don't put in the work for it. It's plain and simple. Right. Like you have to put in the time for it. Now, how much time? That's something that, to be honest, it, it's dependent on a lot of things. It's like the, the closest analogy I take to this is, um, you know, you go to the gym, you can't just put in, you know, one workout and expect results right? Sometimes you got to go consistently with discipline and mm -hmm. keep doing it. Even if it's just 30 minutes a day, like put in the micro effort, but do it discipline and consistency over time, you'll start to see results with your physique or your health goals that you have. Similarly for this one, you know, it, it depends. It depends on your organization, your body type, right? Like mm -hmm. what workouts you're doing, how often you're doing it, how effectively you're doing it. So All of it, that factors into the time. Yeah. It's nuanced. It's it, it's nuanced. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. And the other thing that I'll add to that is, unfortunately, we don't ask that question around things like looking at financials or how long it's going to take to implement a process. Like we don't ask that question because we've been taught that that is a requirement. So you do what's required. Yeah. What we haven't been taught is that these, what some people label as soft skills, but we call critical skills are seen as optional. Um, and they've been, they've been sort of taught as optional, um, even in business schools, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's not a, a, a required thing to talk about how you behave and, you know, really dig into your self-awareness. Yeah. And so it takes a leader to do that too. That's the other thing exactly. too, is I, I'll tell you a <laughs> yeah. quick story. When I worked at Costco, I had all the hard skills to move up that I, that, that were there. I knew the place inside and out in the, in the department I ran and the guy who was in charge of the, the, the regional area said, Mike, you have all the hard skills that we need to fill this. You got to work on your soft skills. I'm like, what are you talking about? And he goes, well, you need to be, and this is, again, you're getting into some of the culture stuff that you talk about here, like empathy, vulnerability, like be, like the people stuff, the human stuff, which, yes. you know, and when, when he pointed that out to me, I realized like 
training manage the difference between a manager and a leader there that's one of the switches right like managers are, are they manage right like i talk about time management versus time leadership i'm not a fan of time management because it, it it's presumption that's arrogant because you cannot manage something that's constantly on the move but you can lead it you can definitely lead it to where you want it to go but that takes nuance and thoughtfulness and all those things that you're right. They get devalued or de-emphasized maybe is a better word. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And and when you do things like, again, kind of outline this stuff as you have in this book, um, it, it, it kind of shines a spotlight on that stuff. Um, I want to ask, because I know they're all, I mean, there are, there are six and I love the number six for, I mean, six is my, it's my, it's my jam. Um, there are six different culture elements here. I don't want to necessarily dive into all of them. We've touched on a couple, um, but they are inclusion, empathy, vulnerability, trust, empowerment, and forgiveness. That's what you outline in part two. I would like both of you, we'll start with you, Muhammad, to say, which one do you think is the one that if people were trying to adopt this strategy. I'm going to ask you this yeah. question. I'm going to, Chris, I'm going to ask you another one. Which one do you think is the one that, that provides the, the least amount of friction or the, the greatest gain right out of the gate? Got it. So the answer to the question is probably something you're not going to like, but it is essentially required for you to have all six pillars to see things move. I look at it, the analogy that we give is that it's like a six cylinder engine and these six uh, you know, behavior traits are six cylinders and they have to fire in synchronous with each other at the right time with the right timing and, and the right you know, power to garner the maximum efficiency from your engine. So we can't say you need to have vulnerability first. Right. Well, okay. then where's trust? You can't say I need to have empathy first to mm-hmm. have trust. Well, not necessarily. You can't have inclusion without empathy. You can't have empathy without vulnerability. You can't have trust without empowerment. Like So just all sure. interconnected and interdependent. So our framework is uh, built to showcase that these all these six behavior pillars are important to experience of cultural love. And you have to work on them all simultaneously. Not one is more important than the other. They're very interdependent. All right. So now I'm going to ask you to be vulnerable and tell me which one of those do you struggle with the most? Me personally? You personally. I believe I I struggle with inclusion the most. Um, I have a tendency to... um, you know, try to be uh, bringing in people that I relate with more often than not. I try to use my comfort level or trust and relationship to bring in people on certain decisions or certain directional uh, aspects of the business. Mm -hmm. And I tend to find myself losing a lot of value because I haven't included those that could have brought me different perspectives and difference of opinions or challenged my thought process. And so I am uh, building my self-awareness around inclusion and recognizing my unconscious bias, but also my intentional approaches that could be leading to exclusion. And so that's the biggest area of opportunity for me to improve and work on. I like how you said that it's the biggest area of opportunity. Like you didn't, like you looked at, you framed it in a positive way. And it's, you know, often we, we write, like I'm a writer too. I, I often write what I need to read. Just as much as, well, what do they say? What's that <laughs> saying? Uh, if you want a book to exist, write the book that you want to read, right? Like write that. Yeah. So the fact that you, that you, you mentioned that I think is, is key. Okay, Chris, um, same question. Which of those six pillars do you struggle with? Or you find that there's opportunity for you to grow and develop in? Uh, for me, it's vulnerability. Um, and it goes back to, so for those who might not see me, I am a, a black man and <laughs> inside of corporate America. Um, and so ever since I was a child, like I was taught that you don't make mistakes, right? Mm-hmm. Like you can't afford to make mistakes. Um, and that's been sort of shared by many people of color, women of color, um, or anybody in a marginalized group or someone that's not in the dominant group. Um, they typically have had to sort of put out there that they are perfect in every single way, overachieve or high achievers, um, et cetera. 
And so all my career and even in school, um, showing weakness um, or showing mistakes or showing a failure um, wasn't considered a winning strategy, right? Right. Um, And so um, even to this day, it's something where I, I... You know, you want to like, oh, here's all the things that are going on in my head and here's what I'm doubting myself on. And then you're like, nope, I have to show that I am not the weak link here. So I'm going to make sure that, you know, the things that I am vulnerable around are Beyonce and things that people can relate to, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, when it comes to like the mistakes and the um, self-doubting and, you know, maybe the worries and fears that I have, I tend to internalize that more so than share it. And and, and again, I mean... There are so many. I know that when I go through these, I think probably the one that I struggle with, eh, it's probably inclusion too, Muhammad. That's the one that I think that I, um, and it's tricky because uh, when you're so deep in the weeds in something, sometimes it's hard to get outside of it and say, okay, what does someone else think? It's, 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 I think I, I notice it more when I'm speaking about something I know a lot about and the person's like, what are you talking about? Like, do you have any, <laughs> like, okay, I should really talk to you more because if, if eventually you go, oh, I get it, then that's probably something I can think about. But yeah, there's a lot, I, I definitely could see that. Something we're working on inside of my business as well, you know, the idea of um, even just subtly doing things like not, like just dropping certain pronouns from our messaging, like completely without, yeah. and not like making grand overtures about it, just doing it in a, just doing it, just acting it as opposed to declaring it. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, As we get close to wrapping up, someone's going to pick up this book. Someone's going to say, you know what? This sounds almost utopian or ideal, like to that, to to something I want to do. I want to build a business like this. Uh, Where, What's one simple action? And I'm going to ask each of you this. Uh, I'll start with you, Muhammad. What's one simple action that someone can take when they pick up this book to get headed in the right direction? I'd say, um, you know, be introspective as you go through the book. And uh, we've designed the book to really garner introspection by sharing our own lived experiences where we try to build an empathic connection to the storytelling inside of a business book. (laughs) Mm-hmm. <laughs> and allowing you, allowing the reader to see themselves through our stories and go on, going on an introspective journey. So I'd say having an open mind and uh, being able to practice introspection so that it garners more self-awareness. Um, that would be my ask to get the maximum value out of the book and ultimately bring value to your business or your life or your career, whatever it is that you're trying to uh, gain from the book. And, and this is not, this is not, uh, I want to be clear for anyone who's listening. Um, this book is not a, I can breeze through it kind of book at all. I think, I think, <laughs> I think the introspection is almost, it's a forced function of it to a degree, right? Like, and I think yeah. that that's, that's an testament to the writing because it, it does pull you in. And there are so many books that I've read, um, that it, it becomes, uh, talking point, anecdote, talking point, anecdote. And and you can normally get, oh, okay, well, I see the point. Now I can skip five or six paragraphs. But this book doesn't work that way. And so I want to uh, make sure I, I, I mention that before, you know, I move on to Chris and ask the same thing. Like, what's one simple action someone can take um, either as they're reading the book, as they're going through it, or maybe, you know, hey, I've gotten through the book. What's the, what is this thing I can do to see, to make, to, to, to have, maybe not get a quick win, but to see this start to take hold and bear fruit? I think the, <clears throat> the first thing or the main thing, um, and this is more internal, it's not really doing anything externally, but it's really, especially inside of corporate America, um, as we talked about, I used to be one, you, you might be a recovering one, like mm-hmm. I'm, you know, right, I'm, we're in the spirit of recovery, but typically the first question when an idea is brought forward to a corporate audience is, how do we scale this? And, you know, it's like, and, and to equate that, imagine going on a first date and the other party is saying, so how do we, how do we build our household income, you know, if we were to get married? And it's just like, I don't even know you. <laughs> like, we haven't even gotten to, like, what you are, who you are. Like, how are you going to take this on? So I think avoiding that rush to get to sort of trying to make something stick everywhere and try and start with yourself, right? As Muhammad mentioned, it's introspection, but also 
you have to start looking at who you are and there is never a convenient time to deal with yourself. I'm just going to go ahead and put that out there, right? Like you have to start looking at you because you will be the method by which things scale, especially if you are a leader, if you are starting a business. And even if you're on a team and maybe you don't have quote unquote the title or the authority, but people are still going to be looking at how you get things done, right? How do you go about sort of completing your work, right? So you can still be, you know, an example for even your leader, um, and I think that we get so stuck on how do we get things sort of uh, uh, adopted inside of an organization wide scale instead of looking at, wait, how am I going to be a, an example or what small commitments and what small thing can I do tomorrow? And I'd even try and make it a 90 day thing or a 100 day thing, but just a tomorrow thing. Um, and we start to see that that changes over time and it changes in more organic ways versus forced ways where we end up going back to what we were doing anyway. Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I think for me, that's the biggest thing is tell yourself to stop trying to worry about everything else and just worry about you. You do you. Yeah. <laughs> in a way, but you're right. Yeah. It's so hard to do that in a, in an environment where it's so objective, right? Like it, yeah. what, I, what I love about what you've said in the book, by the way, love is a business strategy, resilience, belonging, and success. It's a wall street journal and USA today bestseller too. So we're not just, you know, I mean, this is, there's a lot of great, and I love the football playbook stuff. <laughs> uh, I'm a Bengal. I'm a Bengals yeah. fan. Uh, you guys are in no, Houston. Yeah. Well, yeah, we're yes. doing okay this year. We won't talk about the Texans. Um, yeah, please, not. Don't. please don't. <laughs> Um, but, but thank you I for mean, your kindness. Yeah. <laughs> but again, it, it, it's, it's great to see su the embracing of subjectivity in something that is so objective oriented, right? Because while projects and companies like software, there is an objective element to them. If you can bring subjectivity into it, like strengths, um, different ideas and stuff, it only makes it stronger, right? So again, uh, love is a love as a business strategy, look into it. Uh, where can people keep up with you, Muhammad and Chris, and keep up with the work that you're doing? And where can they pick up the book, of course? Yeah, sure. Uh, you can learn uh, more about our book and even purchase books, autographed copies, uh, loveasabusinessstrategy.com. We also have a few resources available that could be valuable for introspection and, and other uh, tips and tricks we have. But besides that, we also have services that we have um, formed an organization to offer culture, culture as a service for the rest of the corporate world at culture-plus.com, uh, culture-plus.com. You can learn more about our services and solutions. And I personally am very active on LinkedIn. So LinkedIn, just search for Mohammed Anwar uh, and Softway or Mohammed Anwar and Love as a Business Strategy and you can connect with me. I'm very responsive and uh, will be able to be accessible to anyone. And we also have a podcast, Love as a Business Strategy, um, available on any place where you might listen to your favorite podcasts. And we have weekly episodes um, around sort of the intersection of our subjectivity and the objectivity of business. So we are open and available for anyone to listen in or watch on loveasabusinessstrategy.com. And again, all these links will be in the show notes. Thanks again so much, Mohammed and Chris, for taking the time to join me today and have a productive conversation. Thank you. Big thanks to the gentlemen for joining me on the program today. If you want to learn more about what we talked about, all that fun stuff, all you need to do is to go to productivityist.com slash podcast 413 and you'll be able to get the show notes. You can also look right now in the podcast app that you're using, which is great. And while you're there, subscribe to the podcast, whether it's Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, wherever, hit the subscribe button. That way you won't miss a single episode of what is to come. And what's to come next week is Joe Churi. I'm excited to welcome Joe to the show. We've had plenty of conversations in the past, but to have him on the program, to have a productive conversation with me about being not almost there, I'm not going to spoil it for you. Uh, it's going to be fantastic. So I hope you'll join me for that. Until then, I'm Mike Vardy, the host of A Productive Conversation, reminding you to stop doing productive and start being productive. I'll see you later. <laughs>